Welcome back to the History of Magic the Gathering, told to a card from every set. Today we'll be talking about Ferros block, Core Set 2015, and Tarkia block. That's seven whole sets. Given that this script is already almost 5,000 words long, let's not use up any more time on intros, and let's jump right in. The runaway success of Innistrad inspired Wizards of the Coast to make more top-down sets, based around popular and folk culture. Enter Ferros, a plane inspired by Greek mythology. Ferros soared like Daedalus into stores in September 2013. So, what are the three primary things you think of when you think of Greek mythology? Noble, yet often tragic heroes, vicious monsters, and rambunctious gods getting up to all sorts of divine antics. Ferros has all three, and centres its three marquee mechanics around these three mythological concepts. Heroes are represented through the mechanic Heroic. When a card with Heroic is targeted by its controller with a spell, a good thing happens. Usually the card gives itself plus one plus one counters, or grows stronger, demonstrating that the card is undertaking a hero's journey. So heroes are here, and they are a key part of Ferros. In fact, if you take the T out of Ferros, the set is literally just called Heroes. Truly, they have some naming geniuses at Wizards of the Coast. Next up are the monsters. All of the iconic monsters from Greek mythology are here. Hydras, Harpies, Minotaur Tribal was even a theme in Limited. There's also a Kraken. They're not from Greek mythology, but there was one in Clash of the Titans, so it was decided that they should shove one in anyway. No, seriously, that's literally why there's a Kraken in the set. To quote Mark Rosewater, one of the lessons of Kamigawa block was that we had to deliver not on what a source of inspiration actually is, but rather on what players think it is. Perception is more important than reality. Clash of the Titans brought Krakens to Greek mythology, so we felt we had to deliver on a Kraken. Just like heroes come with the mechanic heroic, monsters come with the mechanic monstrous. When a monster's in play, you can pump a bit of extra mana into it in order to make it monstrous, placing several plus one plus one counters on it and turning on a new effect or ability. Once our Kraken friend here becomes monstrous, he taps down up to four target creatures, who then don't become untapped until the Kraken is killed. Finally, we come to the gods. Thematically, Pharos was all about Greek mythology, but mechanically, the block made enchantments matter. Enchantments are used to represent either the divine themselves or their influence. The gods themselves are enchantment cards, along with their legendary weapons and the next spawn creatures which they create. Being enchantments, these cards are easier to remove than they would otherwise be, but they make up for it with some powerful effects, and the fact that they now enable enchantment matters strategies. As well as being represented through enchantments, faith in the gods is represented through the devotion mechanic. I've already touched on this mechanic briefly in part 8, but just to recap, a card with devotion cares about the number of mana pips of a certain card that you have in play. So for example, the card Fanatic of Morgis deals damage to each opponent equal to your devotion to red when it enters play. It counts itself, meaning this value will always be at least one, but the more red cards you have, with more red pips, the higher this damage will be. Now then, let's move on to my signature card. I'll tell you this much, it's going to be a god, but which god will it be? Well, Ferros block contains 15 gods total. Five were released in each set. Born of the Gods gave us five gods with allied colour casting costs, Journey into Nyx gave us five gods with enemy colour casting costs, and Ferros itself gave us five mono-coloured gods. Each of these gods is an indestructible enchantment creature. These gods all have powerful effects, but only become creatures when your devotion to the colour or colours they represent passes a certain threshold. The five gods in original Ferros are Heliod, god of the sun, who gives all of your creatures vigilance and lets you create two one cleric enchantment creature tokens for four mana, Fassa, god of the sea, who lets you scry at the beginning of each of your upkeeps and allows you to pay two mana to, to make a creature you control unblockable, Erebos, god of the dead, who prevents your opponents from gaining life while he's in play and lets you pay two mana and two life to draw a card. Porphyrus, God of the Forge, who does 2 damage to each opponent whenever a creature enters play under your control, unless you pay 3 mana to give all of your creatures plus 1 plus 0. And finally, Nylea, God of the Hunt, who grants all of your other creatures trample, and lets you pay 4 mana to give a targeted creature plus 2 plus 2. So which of these iconic gods was my pick? Well, to be honest, by all rights I should have picked Porphyrus. Perforos is by far the most powerful card in the cycle, a fact demonstrated by its significantly higher price tag compared to the others. The amount of damage you can generate with Perforos and a handful of cheap red creatures is honestly insane. Hell, last episode I should have mentioned him as being one of the most powerful goblin tribal commanders, because he really is. Whether you're burning away all of your opponent's life totals at once in a commander game, or searing away at one lone foe's life in a 20 life format, Perforos is capable of dealing a huge amount of damage and quickly. So why wasn't he my choice? Well... The choice that I've made is actually tied into a personal story, rather than the card's viability. So a few years ago, I bought a Ferros booster box, and I was drafting with some friends, when I opened up Nylea, God of the Hunt. She was the lone god I received in that booster box. Last year, I was drafting Ferros Beyond Death, 
I opened one of my packs, and there she is again, Nightly Echinoid. So for being the only Ferocian god I've ever opened in a booster pack, and on two separate occasions, spread out over two different sets, I have to give the award here to Nylea. Born of the gods, descended from the heavens in February 2014. Now the two blocks which I discuss in this video, Feros and Tarkir, were the last blocks in the history of the game to follow the old three sets per block model. Born of the Gods is an excellent demonstration of why this model was moved away from. It suffers from what's commonly known as the middle set problem. It's not a bad set by any means, but it's unexciting. It's just sort of Feros, but more. This makes an archetypal example of the middle set problem. So Feros introduces us to this mythological world. At this stage, it's new, it's novel, and it's exciting. Journey into Nyx, the final set in the block, shakes everything up by placing massive emphasis on enchantments with the introduction of the constellation mechanic. Born of the Gods sits awkwardly sandwiched between the exciting beginning and the end which shakes everything up. A sort of middle which exists just because the story needs to have three parts. It gave us the Inspired and the Tribute abilities, which are a 9 and 10 on the Storm scale respectively. Not even because they're too powerful though, but because market research stated that players found them dull and Wizards of the Coast have no real desire to print cards with them again. Yay. The woes of Born of the Gods run even deeper than this, however. According to data compiled by the Redditor Jambarama, Born of the Gods was tied with betrayers of Kamigawa and rivals of Ixalan as having zero cards that were deemed modern playable when they ran the data in 2019. And, as Betrayers of Kamigawa features the two banned cards Blazing Shoal and Umezawa's Jite, that means Born of the Gods is really only tied at the bottom with Rivals of Ixalan. Or at least, that was the case in 2019. This means that Born of the Gods is a bit on the low side when it comes to power, but even though it's lacking on cards that are playable in modern, it does have one standout card. Brimaz, King of Oreskos, is a free mana, free four cat soldier with vigilance. Whenever Brimaz attacks, he creates a 1-1 cat token with vigilance that attacks alongside him, and whenever he blocks, he makes a 1-1 cat token which blocks along with him. Although Brimaz at present isn't quite powerful enough to be viable in modern, he is the centerpiece of the pioneer cat tribal deck. A fun little deck which was famously piloted by MTG YouTuber Saffron Olive in his Against the Odds series, to great success. This shows that in a format with a smaller card pool to draw from, Born of the Gods can stand out just a little bit more. So go and track down all four people you know who still play Pioneer and let them know that Cat Tribal featuring Brimars may be just the strategy they've been looking for. Magic the Gathering players across the world journeyed together into Nyx with the release of the final set of Feros block in May 2014. Although the entirety of Feros was focused on enchantments, Journey into Nyx dialed that emphasis up to its highest point yet, including many cards with a new constellation mechanic. There are exactly 16 cards of Constellation in Journey into Nyx, a mechanic which means whenever an enchantment enters the battlefield under your control, a good thing happens. As all of the cards of Constellation in Journey into Nyx are enchantments themselves, these cards activate their own ability as they enter play. This contrasts with Constellation's later appearance in Feros Beyond Death, where Constellation only appears on creatures, so you need to jump through some extra hoops in order to trigger it. So, Journey into Nyx gave us a bunch of Constellation cards, but also, like the two sets before it, it gave us a bunch of enchantment creatures. The most notable of which is probably Eidolon of the Great Rebel. In Feros, if a dead person escapes the underworld, then their soul and their body split, becoming two separate entities. Their body wanders listlessly around as a returned, a masked and miserable husk of their former self. Their soul, meanwhile, becomes an Eidolon, a volatile and explosive spiritual being of pure emotion. Eidolon of the Great Rebel is one such being, and was evidently the soul of someone who liked to party. For two red mana, Eidolon of the Great Revel is a 2-2, which deals two damage to any player, even its controller, whenever they cast a spell that costs three or less. It's a pretty powerful component of many mono-red aggro decks in modern. At first, this might seem strange. Isn't the purpose of aggro decks to play a bunch of cheap cards? So won't you just be hurting yourself a lot by playing the Eidolon? Well, yes, you'll probably feel the burn a bit when you play the Eidolon, but you'll damage your opponent even more. Due to the huge card pool in modern, high-cost cards are rarely ever seen. There are plenty of great cards which cost 3 or less to ensure that most decks never really need to play things that cost 4 or more. So functionally, in modern, Eidolon's effect just deals 2 damage whenever any player casts a spell. If you're piloting an aggro deck, you'll hopefully be tearing down your opponent's life total faster than they'll be ripping into yours, so the damage which the Eidolon deals helps push them over the edge. Eidolon of the Great Rebel is also notable for shutting down Storm decks completely. Storm decks, as you may recall, rely on casting a whole bunch of cards in a single turn to build up your storm count super high in order to cast a storm spell which then copies itself repeatedly. 
So yes, a barrage of two damage blasts from the Eidolon will shut that down before it properly has the chance to get started. Unfortunately, due to having an even converted mana cost, it can't be used in any aggro decks which utilise the companion card Abosh the Prey Piercer. So usage of the Eidolon has declined quite a bit since the release of the Courier, but it's still a formidable card and a significant piece of the game's history. Core Set 2015 was released in July 2014. Many Planeswalkers depict characters during notable beats in Magic's story. For example, Garak the Veil Curse depicts the Wild Speaker falling under the thrall of the dark magic of the Chain Veil. Gideon Blackblade depicts the decidedly male Planeswalker leaping from the sky just before his attack on Nicol Bolas during the War of the Spark. The entire concept of the core set Magic Origins was to tell the backstory of the five initial members of the Gatewatch, and to print cards showing them as youths. Core set 2015 contains a Planeswalker card depicting a key moment from Jace Baderan's story arc. Arguably the main character of modern Magic, you'll remember Jace for his absolutely busted mind sculptor printing earlier in World Wake. Well in Dragon's Maze, Jace completed the titular maze, and is rewarded by becoming the Living Guild Pact the physical incarnation of Ravnica's law and the embodiment of the plane's justice. Corset 2015 contains a card depicting Jace at this moment of ascension. Jace, the living guild pact. And it is terrible. For four mana, Jace, the living guild pact comes down with five loyalty counters. He has a plus one ability, which lets you look up the top two cards of your library and put one of them into your graveyard. He has a minus three, which returns a non-land card in play to its owner's hand, and his ultimates as each player shuffle their hands and graveyards into their libraries, and then you draw seven cards. Don't be fooled by that ultimate though. Without doubling season shenanigans, in order to get it off, you first have to spend three turns using his plus one, which in almost every deck does functionally nothing. Most Planeswalker cards follow a similar pattern. They have an ability which grants you card advantage. This might be through drawing you a card, forcing an opponent to discard a card, or destroying some of your opponent's permanents, and then an ability which does a neat thing. This neat thing might be making a creature token, placing down plus one plus one counters, or dealing some damage. Then they have an ultimate which places you at such an advantage that it functionally wins you the game. This isn't a universal pattern, but it's generally what you want to see in a viable Planeswalker card. Save for having a good ultimate, Jace the Living Guild pack doesn't really do anything well. In most decks, his plus one ability barely has a function, apart from to provide some slight filtration. It provides no immediate card advantage, and you don't have the option of putting both cards into your graveyard. So if the top cards of your deck are both lands, you still have to draw one of them. Perhaps if you're running a Demir or a Simic deck, you might be able to reanimate something which the Living Guild Pack dumps into your graveyard. But if that's the case, you'll be much better served running Tamiyo, Collector of Tales, or Liliana, The Last Hope, who, for either the same or an even lower amount of mana, let you chuck stuff into your graveyard far more rapidly and actively return things from your graveyard to your hand themselves. The Living Guild Pact's minus three ability also barely counts as a neat thing. For more than half of his starting loyalty, you cast the spell Disperse, a common card which costs two mana. Not to mention that there are many versions of Disperse, like Callous Dismissal, Blink of an Eye, and Depart the Realm, which, while still being commons that only cost two mana, come with additional upside. Ultimately, Jace forsook the role of the Living Guild Pact. He barely performed its duties, and spent all of his time wandering the multiverse going on adventures instead. Does that mean this card acts as foreshadowing of the fact that he didn't enjoy the role, or is it just a weak card depicting a cool story beat? I'll leave you to decide that for yourself. Khans of Tarkir appeared in stores in September 2014. Like a Lara block before it, Tarkir was based around three colour factions. However, whilst the Lara was built around shards of three colours, Tarkir was built around tricolour wedges. What do I mean by this? Again, the answer can be found by looking at the back of any given Magic the Gathering card. A shard is a colour and it's two allied colours. Pick a colour, add in the two colours adjacent to it in the colour pie, and you have a shard. For example, Grixis is the black scented shard, featuring the colours black, red and blue, because these two colours are adjacent to black in the colour pie. Wedges, meanwhile, are another way of splitting up the colour pie into five free colour factions. They're based around a colour and it's two enemies. For example, Abzan is the black scented wedge, as it features black, white and green. So, free colour wedge factions are what Khans of Tarkir is based around mechanically, What's it based around thematically? Well, each of these three colour factions are based on various Asian cultures. There's the black, white and green Abzan houses, which are based on the Ottomans, the red, white and blue practitioners of the Jeskai Way, who are based on Shaolin monks, the blue, green and red Team of Frontier, who derive their inspiration from Siberian shamanistic culture, the white, black and red Mardu Horde, who are based upon Genghis Khan's Mongolian Horde, and the green, black and blue Sultai Brood, who are based upon the Khmer Empire. Tarkir is a world where these different factions vie for supremacy, but also a world without any dragons. Or at least, 
a world which doesn't have any dragons yet. Some time-travelling antics will fix that up later. Or we'll fix that up earlier, I guess, technically. Appropriately enough for a set of our plot based around time travel, the card we'll be using to represent it is Dig Through Time. Dig Through Time lets you look at the top seven cards of your library, and you put two of them back into your hand, and the rest on the bottom of your library in any order. Pretty powerful effect, right? Well, the card costs nine mana. Sort of. It also has the ability Delve. Delve lets you exile cards from your graveyard as you cast a spell, reducing its cost by one for each card you exile this way. This means that you can wind the cost of Dig Through Time down to as low as two if you have enough cards in your graveyard. Now in standard, this was all right, and Dig Through Time remained legal in the format until it rotated. It's also legal in Pioneer. But in older formats, this caused big problems, and Dig Through Time has been banned in Modern and Legacy, and it's even restricted in Vintage. So, just what makes Dig Through Time alright for Standard, but a huge problem in these older formats? Well, it's all about Delve's interaction with another graveyard mechanic, also one with a name beginning with D, Dredge. We talked about Dredge back in Part 7, but just to recap, if you have a card in your graveyard with Dredge, instead of drawing a card at the start of your turn, you can chuck a certain number of cards from the top of your deck into your graveyard in order to return the card with Dredge to your hand. This works perfectly synergistically with Delve. In fact, too perfectly, hence the ban. The dredge cards let you load up your graveyard incredibly quickly, meaning that you can almost always cast Dig Through Time for only two or three mana. The randomization of your shuffled deck is a major part of the balance of magic, so being able to subvert this by looking through your deck seven cards at a time and grabbing two of them each time, and repeating this many times a game, means that you can search through your deck for all the cards you need to win far faster than intended. Although Dig Through Time is a card I'm choosing to represent cards, it sits alongside a very similar card, Treasure Cruise, which is also an expensive blue spell that gets its cost reduced to a trivial price due to Delve, and it's also banned in all the same formats. Treasure Cruise lets you draw three cards, meaning it's an ancestral recall if you delve a bit perfectly. Fate Reforged was pieced together for a January 2015 release. Now in this series, there have been cards which I've discussed as important for a variety of reasons. The Black Lotus for its power and its iconic status. Maze's End for simply being a fun alternative win. And a Chroma Angel of Wrath for having like a million keywords. But the card I'll be talking about today is important for a reason beyond merely its impact on gameplay. The card which I'll be using to represent Fate Reforged is one of the cons of the Marju Horde, Alicia, who smiles at death. Alicia is a free mana free two with first strike and the ability to bring back two mana value or less creatures from your graveyard for a small fee whenever she attacks. A reasonably powerful card to be sure, but that's not the reason why I've chosen Alicia to represent Fate Reforged. Alicia is a transgender woman. She's the central character of the story The Truth of Names, which I've linked in the description and I'd strongly recommend. Transgender people are often not represented in media at all, or worse, when they do appear, they're made the butt of jokes or the subject of mockery and derision. Alicia is presented significantly more positively. She's presented not as a cheap punchline or a victim, but as a dragon slayer and a fearless commander, with absolute confidence in who she is and in her own authority and autonomy. This is really important. Magic the Gathering is a franchise with global reach, which caters to a huge and diverse audience. By including transgender characters in the stories which they tell, Wizards of the Coast are able to both show the transgender members of their audience that they matter and that their stories are worth telling, and to educate others and to show them that transgender people are just as capable of being heroes and protagonists as anyone else might be. There are many large intellectual properties, like, to take a completely random example, I don't know, Harry Potter, which are not so inclusive and welcoming. It's a feather in Wizards of the Coast's cap that they've taken this step. Alicia sits alongside several other LBGT and gender fluid Magic the Gathering characters, such as Ral Zeric, Nico Aris, as well as Chandra and Nisa. Oh, wait, my bad. Despite years of build up and chemistry between the two of them, it turns out Chandra's only in two people who are decidedly male. Yeah, okay. Wizards of the Coast don't always do fantastically at crafting LBGT tales, but with Alicia, at least in my opinion, they knock it out of the park. If you're interested in looking at the representation of transgender characters in Magic the Gathering in more detail, I've linked a video where Spice 8 Rack and Amanda Stevens discuss the subject in the description. For now, let's take a look at the final set we'll be analysing today. Dragons of Tarkir took flight in March 2015. To very quickly summarise the storyline of Tarkir block, initially the dragons on the plane are extinct, with only a handful of relics, such as the Dragon Throne of Tarkir, surviving as a testament to their former power. In Fate Reforged, the planeswalker Sarkin Vol hops back in time to before the death of dragons and saves the planeswalker Yugin from being killed by his brother Nicole Bolas, as depicted on the card Crux of Fate. Look, there's Bolas and Yugin fighting, and you can even see little Sarkin watching from way down here. 
Saving Yugen's life results in dragons not dying out, and in fact coming to dominate the world. So when Sarkin returns to the present, he slipped into an alternative timeline, one where the Khans and their clans are beaten into submission, and dragons now rule Tarkir. Although Tarkir block was the final block to be composed of a series of three sets, it does so in a masterful and creative way, giving the old format a terrific send-off. Both Khans and dragons are large sets, which can be drafted independently, and though they can't be drafted with each other, either one can be drafted with Fate Reforged. How is this possible? Well, Khans, as we discussed earlier, focuses on three colour wedge factions. Dragons, meanwhile, is built around two colour factions, for each allied colour pair. In other words, the five colour pairs which were not featured in Strixhaven. Fate Reforged, as we saw of Alicia who smiles at death, makes use of hybrid mana. So if you're drafting Fate Reforged along with Khans of Tarkir, Alicia fits in comfortably with a Mardu deck. But if you're drafting Fate Reforged and Dragons of Tarkir, then you can instead fit her into your Kolligan deck. That's the red slash black Dragons of Tarkir faction. But in any case, enough about drafting and block structure. What card will be my signature card for Dragons of Tarkir? Some giant scaly menace, no doubt, right? Actually, no. Arguably the most impactful card in Dragons of Tarkir isn't even a dragon at all. It's a cheeky little spell which reminds us that even in this new timeline, humans and the like may just have a chance at survival after all. Collected Company. For 4 mana, Collected Company lets you look at the top 6 cards of your deck and bring up to 2 creatures that cost 3 or less but you see they're straight into play, without needing to pay their cost. This already sounds good, I'm sure, but it gets even better when you see that it's an instant. Your opponent can be swinging in, thinking you've got an empty board, when all of a sudden you have Garruk's Harbinger blocking them and a Skyclave Apparition exiling their biggest threat. Collected Company is amazing, if you construct your deck around it right. You'll almost always get it to fetch two creatures for you each time, and as such you'll always want four copies of it. It's terrific in modern, historic and pioneer, I guess if you can collect enough people that still play that format, but it's not quite as good in Commander. Because cutting out creatures that cost 4 or more is a significantly bigger setback in that format, but it's still very much an option if you want it. So, Collected Company is a very powerful green card, which provides a huge amount of card advantage, whilst also creating a threatening board presence. It's certainly not the last green card we'll be seeing that's this powerful. Well, there we are. With the end of Dragons of Tarkir, we reach the end of the free set block model. It's lasted us quite a while, starting all the way back in Ice Age in 1995, but we're going to put it to rest now. Speaking of long-running structures that are being put out to pasture, join me next time for Magic Origins, which was initially intended to be the final core set, even though things ultimately didn't quite pan out that way, as well as the first two two-set blocks, Battle for Zendikar and Shadows over Innistrad. Wow, we're getting scarily close to the present day now, aren't we? I'll see you next time.